Met Virtual Traveller. Hello and welcome to Stories from Law, a monthly podcast that explores folklore and the stories it inspires. My name is Dawn Nelson and I'm an author and professional storyteller. Today I have for you a very special episode which explores the stories and folklore that were handed down to us as children. My guest today is Selini, a friend whom I met through storytelling and who has been kind enough to agree to share these stories with us. Cellini lived for a while in Naples and has Italian relatives. She has many stories of the way in which Italian culture relates to death. And so this episode relates to some of the subjects covered in season two's episode to The Dead Do Tell Tales. As she is able to speak Neapolitan, she has also been able to research a fascinating tradition from Naples, which is called the Italian Skull Cult. There is very little in English about this cult and she's had to look at videos and documents that are in Neapolitan and she's going to share some of those with us today. The subject of death is of course a very personal one and Selini and I have tried to impart these anecdotes and stories with care and respect but obviously they are from our point of view and there are some of our own opinions in there and there are some concepts within this podcast that may not be suitable for younger members of the family. So your grandmother lived in Naples. Were there any little bits of folklore that she passed on to you as you were growing up or any stories that she told you? Well, that that grandma, um, she's uh, very Catholic. I mean, the other one is too, but this one is very, very Catholic. And um, the, all, all the kind of folklore was more around the saints and what people that she knew um, you know, had prayed for and it happened or little miracles that they say were miracles, you know, like, oh, little Jimmy was about to get run over by the tractor and then there was a hole and he didn't get run over and he was fine. So San Gennaro helped him or something, you know, so that obviously it's a saint. Um, you know, just things like that or the little story of... Um, the dead man getting up and witnessed it. Okay, tell us that one then. Tell us that one. <laughs> well, it's, it's, yeah, it's not even like a big story, but yeah, really horrible man that, um, you know, d- was uh, quite sinful, um, died. Uh, everyone knew what he was like and his family knew what he was like and nobody was really mourning him that much. Um, but at the wake um, in Italy, e- even now, well, even until about 10 years ago when I was there, if somebody around, well, I don't know what it's like in the north, but if around south, if somebody dies at home, they stay in the home. Yeah, like, so if somebody dies, you um, you go, you go straight away. If somebody tells you somebody died, you go because you have that day to basically uh, visit the family, uh, see the body, uh, which apparently is a very important part, which I didn't understand <laughs> as a child. Um, but, you know, you see the body, you know, you say your prayers and you say your condolences and everything, and people just kind of stay around the house and see if anyone needs any help or if anything needs to be done um, before the um, undertakers come and they just put the body directly in the coffin take it to the church where everybody's having a funeral and then they take it directly to the cemetery where they get walled up in the weird walls. I don't know if you saw them. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, the cemeteries are very different. <laughs> you don't really bury people. There's like big walls of um, weird spaces. Yeah, yeah, I suppose. And some families have their own little houses. I found that very strange. But it's, well, again, it's just different, but it's, it's, it's kind of nice in a way, you know. Mm. But yeah, well, yeah, basically everyone was at the house because this guy had died and everyone was doing the normal things and the guy was there dead and some people were, you know, talking about if if he'd gone to heaven or hell and kind of joking about it really because obviously they were like, yeah, of course he's gone to hell, like he's, he's not a good Catholic, he's not a good Christian man. And somebody was like, yeah, I don't believe in any of that, like, you know doesn't exist there's nothing after death 
you know, when you did, you've gone. And the day guy sits up, looks at him and says, hell exists and that's where I am. And then drops back down dead. But yeah, so Nanny always tells me this. It's a really interesting um, tradition that you've just described there. Thank you, um, Salini. And the, uh, the little story, I mean, there's so many of those in folk tales and the fact that that's one that actually comes from your from your grandmother and uh, is, is an urban legend, if you like, is... <laughs> Yeah, is it, yeah, it's like, oh, you know, my cousin's father's something, but, you know, it's just like, oh, yeah, and they were there and they saw it. And it's like, oh, yeah. OK, all right, Annie, <laughs> yep, yep, good. That's fabulous. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. So when I was doing my research for the uh, the Dead Do Tell Tales podcast, I discovered the Nantitas, the little skulls um, that they had. And uh, when we uh, met for um, Storytelling Club, you uh, had a similar story, but it came from Naples. Um, and I would love to, to hear a bit more about those um, skulls uh, and, uh, um, and the tradition surrounding that and the stories that are surrounding it. So if you, if you could share that with us, that would be fabulous. Thank you. Yeah. Um... I, I came across this, I can't even remember how or why right now, but I came across this and it, it, it's really strange to me because I, I, you know, as I said, I, I lived in Italy um, near Naples for about 10 years growing up. And I've always been quite interested in um, skulls and kind of memento mori type thing. Mm. And um, I noticed in, in in the south of Italy in particular, um, skulls, uh, they're quite um, prominent. Um, and you get a lot of skull jewellery and skull like that. And it's not just like now because it became fashionable kind of thing, you know, like recently the kind of skull and crossbones and stuff became fashionable. It's just, I think it's a, a part of the Catholic memento mori type thing that never really kind of went away. We had like the Victorians, <laughs> but um yeah, kind of went away here, but um, yes, yeah, so it really surprised me that I'd never heard of it, but as soon as I uh, came across it, I was like, right, I want to find out everything I can about this. How did I not know? But basically, in, um, Naples is, uh, oh, it's a very weird place for many different reasons, but um it's, it's obviously got a long history of, um, you know, you had the Greeks and the Romans kind of founding it in a way. Um, and to build all their lovely buildings, they uh, mined for um, tuff, tuffo it's called in Italian. It's a type of volcanic rock that I think is quite specific to... Um, that area. I think they still call it Tufa Rock. Do they? Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I've heard of Tufa Rock anyway, so. <laughs> Perfect then. <laughs> Tufa <laughs> Rock. It's, it's kind of yellowy, orangey, and apparently it's great for boiling stuff. Um, so Naples is like, underneath Naples, there's so much of it. There's just so much of it. And they mined so much of it. I mean, I think they, um, what we know, is they started mining as far back as like the the eighth century BC. It, quite a long time they've been doing this, and they've been doing it until fairly recently. Um, so much so that um, under Naples, it's it's basically honeycomb. There's uh, the, there's not that much support under Naples, which is quite scary. And actually, re researching this. Um, I remembered that when I was growing up there, we, I don't know if this is urban legend or not, I can't find anything specific, but I remember there was a tale that we would tell basically of a woman walking home with her shopping just down the road and suddenly just under her feet, a hole opens up and she falls in it and never seen from again. Wow. Yes. Yeah, like growing up, I was like, surely that can't be a thing. Surely that can't be real. But then, yeah, actually, uh, Naples has quite a few sinkholes, has quite a few um, 
yeah, cases of just buses going along the road and then half of it just tipping into a hole. And they're not like small holes. They're like, oh, look, there's actually nothing underneath it. Because when, when they would mine, they would kind of make a kind of bottle type shape and mine downwards. And then when they'd finished and got everything they needed, they would just kind of put some wooden boards on top of it put a bit of earth on top of it and just kind of forget about it and go, oh yeah, that's fine. Let's build on top of it now. Um, <laughs> yeah, in, in, in the 80s, um, actually I think it was 1980, there was quite a bad earthquake in Naples. Um, and my, my parents were living there at the time actually. And um, my dad is English. Um, my mom is Italian. Um, so as soon as the earthquake happened, she knew what to do. She was like, right, come on, get out. We've got to get out. We've got to get out. Come on. And then my dad was kind of like, what? what? Um, so they went outside and then everyone was outside like, oh, my God, oh, my God. Even after the tremors stopped, they knew that there would probably be an aftershock. So everyone was staying outside. And I was like, wait a second. He went back in to get his beer. Um, <laughs> they were like, oh, my God. Because, yeah, he, he wasn't, um, yeah, he wasn't used to that. But... It, I think in that particular earthquake, it was a big villa that somebody had built. And I'm not sure if they were aware of it or not, but they built it right over one of the um, old entrances to the mine, the kind of bottleneck. And that just plunged straight in. Luckily, no one was home, but that, that, that's gone. That's just, <laughs> it's just down into the mine because some of the mines are really, really deep. Some of them not so deep like the Fontanella one, that's not very deep because you can just walk into it. It's not uh, great for the structure. It's great for catacombs, though. Um, <laughs> so tell us about the Fontanella. Oh, yeah. The, it was um, discovered in a way, um, I think in when was it? The, the 1500s, because uh, apparently there was a really big storm and that area, um, especially that road, the Fontanella Road, it gets flooded. As soon as there's a big storm, uh, it floods, but it doesn't just flood with water. Um, they call it la lava, the lava. It's not lava, but it is mud and pretty hefty chunks of rock, like big chunks of rock that you'd have to like use a couple of hands to pick up and until the 1950s this was still happening um they hadn't sorted it out <laughs> so the lava would come <laughs> in big storms and um once in the 1500s the lava came and was uh flowing through and um a chasm opened up in the road and um, lots of human remains started to come out. Um, we don't know how long these human remains have been there, but um, we know that that area used to be um, a uh, necropolis for the ancient Romans and Greeks. So, yes, those remains could be quite old. Um, but yeah, so they yeah they discovered it and then they realised oh actually that's that's a good idea but because at the time that area of Naples was called uh, Sanita, which means health, um, because apparently the air was so lovely it was very um, sort of a place to live, whereas now it's one of the most run down and dangerous areas to live uh, oh, because wow. of the Camorra yeah um, uh, but yeah at that time that that area wasn't actually in the walls of Naples. So at the time you, you would want to get buried inside the walls of Naples. You really wouldn't want to get buried outside of it. Um, but uh, a lot of, um, well, the plague came along and then a famine came along and then cholera came along. I think the plague actually uh, took about half the population of Naples at the time. And uh, as much as uh, like people were dying, like as, as many as about 1,500 a day at one point. So obviously there's nowhere to bury these people. There was 
yeah, no, no way to bury them inside the walls. So sadly, they had to be put elsewhere. And they knew of this place, this this cave. Um, and yeah, they would just get kind of shoved in there, higgledy piggledy. Just you know, there weren't that many people. Well, there were there were people um, that were kind of undertakers, but not really. Um, usually it was um, convicted criminals or prisoners that would do this work. And the problem is, like I said before, the um, it would still be flooded. This area was a, an area that was very prone to flooding. And uh, unfortunately, again, you know, again, the mud and the rocks would also uh, bring the dead bodies um, out into the streets, dead bodies and the human remains. And uh, it was so bad that um, lots of people would refuse to leave their houses um, while the bodies were there because they thought they might recognize somebody. Um, and this happened a lot. So they've got this, they've got this um, cave, this catacomb, uh, where they have been able to bury or store, or might be a better word, I don't know, the, the, um, the bodies from these um, tragedies that have happened through history, the cholera and the plague. And, um, and there are many problems with it, but um, there also comes out of that, you told us that came out of that was a, a tradition um, of, uh, of worshipping these skulls. So could you tell us a little bit more about that? That would be great to hear about. Thank you. So yeah, um, in the 1800s, uh, one of the church guys was like, oh, okay, well, we have to do something for these remains. It's not good that they're just, you know, basically just piles of bones right now you know we have to do something we have to clean them up we have to do something with this so he got the help of mostly women um to uh basically order the bones up kind of like an ostiary you see you know all the skulls here and all the like bones here and you know all lovely and neat and at that time Obviously, the women were thinking about the fact that these poor souls hadn't had a burial. So that means that then they're not in heaven, can't get to heaven, they're in purgatory. So as, you know, they're cleaning the bones and ordering them, that you know, they say little prayers. And it kind of just grew into this kind of um, cult um around a kind of a, a kind of give and take you know it's like I, I i'm gonna pray for you because you can't get into heaven without people praying for you and looking after you and looking after your remains but i kind of want something in return if i'm doing that so <laughs> maybe you'll give me the winning lottery numbers lottery numbers come up a lot it's very strange even now like I, I, you know, to research it, I was watching videos and old lady, even now, like literally like just a couple of years ago was asking the skulls saying, come on, like I've been asking you for the lorry numbers and you never given them to me. What's going on? Like <laughs> literally talking like you would to a friend, you know, like just like, oh, come on, you know, what have I got to do? So, you know, that that comes up a lot. But, um, you know, there's, there's this um, kind of, strange give and take with the skulls and it kind of evolved and grew into different rituals around it like it it grew quite a lot um around the world wars because um you know memory away it was just the women and the children and nobody was helping them so they thought okay well you know, we have somebody that we're not asking here for help. Um, also, they were used as like shelters, like very gentle bomb shelters. Um, also, yeah, um, the Italians are not, they're generally not as squeamish around death and, you know, and, and things to do with that and human remains and stuff. It's just more seen as a part of you know, it just happens kind of thing. So, you know, it, 
nobody was really scared being around uh, human remains and stuff. When the Skull Cult kind of came about, um, Mondays was the day to go. Like, you could go any day. But on Mondays, uh, apparently Monday night, the Virgin Mary um, <laughs> decided who to send to heaven from purgatory, apparently. I don't know if that's actually a thing in the religion, but in this cult, it was. Uh, so Mondays you'd go and you'd, you know, you'd do all your bits and stuff, but it became a kind of uh, social gathering for women and children. And it'd be nice, you know, you get out of the house, have a natter with people, and you say your prayers and stuff. And, you know, but these skulls were kind of seen as part of the family as well. So you would go and you'd, six skulls and say your prayers and just kind of include them in the, the the feeling and you know and just the meeting of everyone and the children playing and you know just kind of what you do to go and visit an aunt or a nan or something you know you just oh, there we go there were two ways to kind of choose a skull uh, one way would be you wait for a dream and in the dream, the person would come to you and tell you where the skull was. Like, uh, similar to what you were saying. Yeah, like the nun teachers, yeah. Uh, yeah. So th there's that way. But I think it's more common for people to go and choose a skull and then wait for a dream, and wait for them to come to you in a dream and tell you who they were because that's kind of how they would communicate with you in dreams. Um, so yeah, so you'd have these two ways of choosing a skull in a way. And then once you, you, you got your skull sorted and picked out, um, you would clean the skull, clean it very nicely, clean the area where you would put it. And then you'd put down a little, uh, like a little hanky, like a lacy hanky skull on it and then put a rosary around its neck yeah and then you know you say your prayers and you might bring some flowers or like some candles and you, you know you would you would pray to it but you would also um ask it for things that you might need um lottery numbers come up a lot again <laughs> but um yeah, so you, you know, you would wait for dreams or um, you would wait for the good things to happen. And if you thought, oh, these good things aren't happening, um, you could just pick another skull and just try your hand with that one. That one might be better. But if, if you did get something good come to you, uh, the skull would get a little upgrade. So you'd, you'd take the hanky away and you'd put a little cushion underneath it. And then again, if you got something even better, it would get an upgrade again and it would get its own little kind of house. Um, you know, like little columns and a little little roof. Um, and these were all different types. Um, some of them even had like locks on. So nobody else could get their hands on, you know, your one that was obviously really good and you didn't want it, it you know, you didn't want this skull, you know, working for anyone else. It's just yours kind of thing. But, you know, there's all different types. Like, you know, if you didn't have much money and all you had was a biscuit tin, you use the biscuit tin. Um, if if you could make something out of wood or have somebody make a little house out of wood, you do that. And really, um, you know, if, if the skull had done something really good and if you could afford it, you'd even have them made out of marble. So custom made little house things out of marble. And usually you'd um, you'd put your name on it. Usually it wasn't the name of the skull that you would put on it, but you'd put something like the grazie di Shavuta, so for the graces received, and then you'd put your name on it or your family's name on it. So people would know, oh, okay, well, that family has this skull. And, you know, that's kind of for them. And you still see these, like, they're still there. It, it was shut in um, 1969 because, yeah, the church was like, yeah, we, we can't we can't be a party to this, we can't condone this. But even then, even while it was shut, people would still go to the, the gates and see if they could see shadows at night. Um, again, from a specific skull called Don Francisco, 
and he would um he was a, a spanish guy that um was um, part of the cabala um so apparently he was good at um at, <laughs> yeah at predicting the lottery numbers um so yeah so even even while it was closed people would still go to the gates and see if they could see some shadows and stuff so you mentioned um, that that one had a name. Were there others that had names as well? We got quite, we got quite a few that are kind of famous or well known. The backstories are really kind of just invented at this point. There are there are actually a couple of skeletons that are, are intact, and they were rich uh, nobles, um, but nobody really goes to them. I mean, they might say, you know, oh, sorry about what happened to you, or whatever, you know, as you would in a cemetery but they're not um they're not the ones you go to for specific things so like there, there are there are certain specific skulls that have been given names and backstories um that are kind of more like popular saints now obviously not official saints at all with the church but they've kind of been given this this role yeah people have just given them these things and you you could adopt these skulls and make them you know the ones that you specifically pray for but it, it's it would be more like i don't know like if you just adopt a skull and then this person comes to you in a dream and says oh this is who i was in life you know i was a doctor my name was this you know it's more of a personal connection whereas with these other skulls that are more famous it's more like a, a i don't know skull. yeah like a community skull and not like a you know uh you know like a personal kind of like you, you go and you talk to them like you know as if they were a friend or part of the family but um yes yeah, so we got a few but like don francesco with the lottery numbers um we've got we've got a couple of skulls that according to urban legend quite a, quite a recent urban legend um in the 50s and 60s um uh the the universities the university students that were studying uh, medicine needed uh skulls and body parts and it said that they would give uh, fifty thousand lira per skull yeah which was quite a bit back then um so a couple of broke dudes were like oh, there's laser skulls just lying in there let's just take a couple but apparently from the first night they started seeing things and hearing things and if they fell asleep they'd had nightmares saying give us back um so yeah so they just put them back with a little note saying thank you for everything but we just want to be able to sleep again <laughs> sorry so you've got those two that they don't have names but they're in that uh, you've got pasquale caparossa which means pasquale um red-headed pasquale um and they also call him um, the postman basically he comes to people in their dreams um dressed as a postman <laughs> with red hair funny enough um and he brings messages from uh sometimes people's loved ones actual loved ones that are gone or <laughs> again lottery numbers um or if if uh, he'll come to you if you're gonna um have good news there's going to be something good that's going to happen to you. So he's quite a nice one that people, you know, they'll say hi to. I hope to see him. Um, you got a couple of um, small skulls called the twins. They were children, obviously. Um, and uh, these twins, sometimes uh, couples will adopt them if they can't have children. And sometimes uh, the woman ends up getting pregnant. Um, sometimes with twins so you know that's um their favorites as well and sometimes just because obviously they're children so they get left a lot of toys and you know people say hello to them and stuff anyway um there's a skull with um what looks like ears um some people say it's it's you know the the cartilage is been preserved but actually it's more likely that just some of the bones have come off on the skull and it looks like he has ears but um he's quite popular 
because uh, obviously he's got ears so he can hear you better. <laughs> so it's more likely that he'll uh, be able to hear your requests and therefore do something about them. So I quite, I quite like. Um, you've got uh, Lucia, uh, Lucy, who um, uh, helps um, women find a husband. Um, and there's uh, a few little stories um, about her. There's a couple of stories, but basically it ends up that she, she was going to get married, but she gets murdered the day before. So yeah, she, she never, she never manages to get married. So I'm not, I'm not quite sure why people would go to her to get a husband. Doesn't seem nice. Cause I think the husband had a hand in, well, the husband to be had a hand in murdering her. In some of the stories, so I'm not not sure why you'd go to her. But anyway, poor lady. Maybe, maybe she'd be good at identifying the ones that you shouldn't marry. Oh, <laughs> yes, she can tell you which ones are good or not. Yes, I like yeah. that. <laughs> but yeah, so you got Lisa. You got um Donna Concetta, which is a very famous one. Uh, lady Concetta, because she uh she never has dust on her because apparently she sweats. So, and, and it's true, she is always kind of um, damp. There, there must be some sort of scientific explanation for this, but basically the explanation is for the skull cult that um, obviously to, to grant people's um, graces and favors, it's, it, you know, it's, it's an effort, <laughs> you know, she's doing work, she's, properly working in purgatory for you so her sweat is is the answer to that and people will touch the skull to try and get some sweat because apparently it's good in some way it's, yeah then we have um we have the captain mr captain um not a sea captain a kind of um like chief of police type captain um and he's i think he's famous because he's quite recognizable because uh his his around uh, one of his uh, eyes is black completely black so he's yeah recognizable so i suppose uh stories have sprung up about how that could be and why that could be um but he apparently is quite um he's he, it's quite stern, quite vengeful. So you treat him with the respect. Even if you're not going there to see him, you you know, you treat him with respect. You say hello and you know, you don't want to get on the wrong side of him, apparently. <laughs> okay. So um a lot of this, my understanding from you is that a lot of this um uh history is obviously is oral history because you've been watching it um as uh videos, but it's also in Neapolitan, is that is that correct? Yeah. Um, the, the, what I could find written down in kind of, you know, proper Italian, let's say, um, was a lot of copying and pasting um, <laughs> from one source that then people just basically copied and pasted onto their own website, um, basically word for word. So it was very difficult. It was, it was quite frustrating trying to find more information about it so yeah so looking at videos um and people talking about it and you know like old ladies that used to go there before it was shut in the 60s okay yeah. well i mean thank you thank you for uh, giving us the benefit of your knowledge of neapolitan <laughs> because <laughs> because uh, it's obviously a very difficult thing to find information on and um i certainly didn't find much when i uh, much that i could read as a as a person speaking english <laughs> um uh, when i was doing my research for the podcast so thank you um Selene. and did you yes. say it was opening again did you mention that there was oh yeah yeah it opened it opened in um apparently 2010 wow um yeah um although it, it wasn't open um every day in 2010 like it was kind of appointment only but now it's properly uh, open it's open every day apart from you know holidays between 10 a.m and 5 p.m and yeah lots of tourists go it's free to go so if anyone finds themselves in naples just have a look 
visit um, La Fontanella. Yeah, this is the Fontanella Cemetery. Well, thank you very much for sharing that information with us, Lini. That's been great. Thank you. Thank you for doing the podcasts. They're, they're great. <laughs> Again, thank you to Cellini for sharing those stories with us. And I really did find that whole conversation fascinating. I hope you did too. If you enjoyed this episode and you have a story that was passed down from your ancestors or an anecdote or an urban legend about a place where you live or used to live that you would like to share, then please do get in touch as I would love these episodes to become a series within the Stories from Law podcast. Thank you, as always, to my patrons for their continued support of my storytelling and the podcast. My patron is called Rewild Yourself Through Story and is focused on using story to reconnect with the land we live on and the nature within it. You can become a patron to benefit from a range of rewards, digital zines, ways to connect with nature through story, audio stories, extended versions of this podcast and online workshops are all available as rewards. There are, of course, other ways to support the podcast, and you can do this by sharing the podcast with your friends or leaving me a review. All these things help the stories travel to new audiences and find new souls to warm. If you wish to hear more stories woven with folklore in the old ways, you can find me on Instagram as Dee Dee underscore Storyteller, on Facebook as Dee Dee Storyteller, and via my Facebook group, Stories from Law where there are Facebook lives and behind the scenes and we share books and music recommendations and chat a little about the podcast. I hope to see you there as I'd love to tell you another story. Until then, I'll see you next time. Toodle pip! <laughs>